this is the story of Genevieve Lemite, a Belgian woman who killed all five of her children. On February 28, 2007, she killed each of her children by slitting their throats with a kitchen knife. In this video, I will narrate the entire story. If you do end up liking, please subscribe. Genevieve was born on November 16, 1966. She was born in Brussels. Her father was Michel, a businessman, and her mother was Marina, a nurse. Genevieve had two younger sisters, Catherine, born in 1969, and Mirelle, born in 1972. In school, though Genevieve struggled with her coursework and self-confidence during her secondary studies, she graduated in 1991 with a diploma in French and History from the Educational Institute of Social Promotion of the French Community. It was during that year, between 1988 and 1989, that Genevieve met her future husband, Boucheb Mokadem. Boucheb himself was studying mathematics and physics, but did not complete his studies. Genevieve and Mokadem married on September the 22nd, 1990, and they moved into the apartment of Dr. Michel Shah. Dr. Shah was a physician, and he was a longtime friend of Mokadem. Mr. Shah had befriended Mokadem's family in Morocco in the 1980s. Mokadem is of Moroccan descent, and he served as Mokadem's host in Belgium. Mokadem himself considered Shah as an adoptive father, and whilst Mokadem worked at a convenience store, it was Shah that was the primary financial provider. Genevieve herself did not object to living with Shah in his apartment as she thought it would be on a temporary basis. Genevieve was under the impression, we are newlyweds, we just got married, we'll live with Mr. Shah for now, but eventually we will move out. In 1991, Genevieve was hired as a teacher. Shortly after beginning her new career, she gave birth to her first child, Yasmin. Three years later, she delivered her second child, Nora. Now between 1995 and 1996, Genevieve was granted leave from her teaching position due to postpartum depression. And after the birth of their first child Yasmin, Dr. Shah purchased a house for himself and the couple to live in, and he dedicated his apartment to his practice. So just to give you further context, even though they've been married now and they have kids, they're still living with Dr. Shah. And in 1996, Dr. Shah hired Mokadem to serve as his filing assistant part-time and then full-time in 1998. During this period, Dr. Shah still covered most expenses, including vacations, house repairs, monthly allowances, life insurance for each family member. Genevieve gave birth to two more daughters, Miriam, born in 97, and Mina, born in 99. Before the family's move from Brussels to the provincial town of Nivelle, Shah paid the mortgage and lived on the second floor. Tensions began rising between Genevieve and her husband. Mokadem would spend long hours away from the home, becoming a regular at a bar and a spa. In addition, he would take several trips each year to visit his family in Marrakesh, with the length of each trip ranging from a week to a month. Genevieve's first son and fifth child, Mehdi, was born on August 9, 2003. The following year, Dr. Shah recommended that Genevieve should see a psychiatrist and she began consulting the psychiatrist, Dr. Dederik Veldekens, in 2005. It is also crucial to understand that when they went on their honeymoon, Dr. Shah was present and Dr. Shah even paid for the honeymoon. In fact, Dr. Shah shared the same bedroom during their honeymoon. On February 28, 2007, Mokadem was expected to return from a trip to Morocco to visit his family. Genevieve took her eldest daughter Yasmin to a dermatology appointment. After picking up the rest of her children from school and preparing lunch for them, Genevieve heard a voice tell her the machine is running. Genevieve then mailed two letters, one letter with jewellery for her sisters and the other letter to her friend Valerie. In the letter to Valerie, she called Dr. Michel Shah a rotten bastard who stole the intimacy between herself, her husband and her children. We are now starting to see the motive, but more on that later. She also accused her husband of being deaf and blind to her concerns regarding Dr. Shah. After mailing the letters, she went to a grocery store and slipped 
two knives into her shopping bag. Genevieve told investigators that when she returned, she hid the knives in a drawer and called over her youngest daughter Mina while the other children were watching Spy Kids 3. Genevieve tried to strangle Mina, but when the child struggled, Genevieve resorted to slashing her throat with one of the stolen knives, all while speaking comforting words and apologizing to the child. Medi was the next to be killed, the youngest and the only son. When her attempts to strangle her child again failed, Genevieve cut Medi's throat and washed the knife afterward in the bathroom sink. According to her account, Genevieve then told daughter Miriam that she had a surprise for her in the office. When Miriam entered the office, Genevieve told her to sit on a chair and wear a blue handkerchief over her eyes. Once Miriam was seated, Genevieve took a marble plaque she found nearby and smashed it over Miriam's head and then cut her throat. Nora, who was allegedly Dr. Shah's favourite, was asked to sit in a chair while Genevieve slit her throat from behind. After Nora had been killed, Genevieve wrote the letters J-U-D on the bathroom mirror in Nora's blood and later stated that she had intended to spell the name Judas of Brabant Wallen in Nivelle. Genevieve's lawyers were Daniel Sprutels and Javier Magni. The jury consisted of eight women and four men. Genevieve confessed to the murder of her children so the trial focused on what drove Genevieve to commit the crime. Javier Magni told the jury, your task is to discover why a woman who had hitherto too been a perfect mother suddenly exploded. This statement was made early on in the trial and Shah accompanied her and Mokadem on their honeymoon and stayed in the room. Genevieve stated, we had to wait until he fell asleep before we could make love. I found that weird but Boucher said he regarded him as a stepfather. I think the doctor loved my husband in a platonic way, said Genevieve. Apart from explaining Shah's intrusion on her relationship with her husband, Genevieve also mentioned their family's reliance on Dr. Shah. He watched TV with us in the evenings and went on holiday with us in the summer. We depended on him financially, said Genevieve. Mokadem at first appealed the decision but later withdrew his objection. Following the trial, Genevieve was not able to pay for the trial costs. So, under Belgian law, it fell to her now ex-husband to pick up the bill. Yes, Mokadem had to pay for her lawyer's expenses or trial expenses. This conformed to the law of Belgium, with the state seeking funds due to have been shared from the sale of their house under their divorce agreement. The overall court expenses and fines were 72,000 euros. Mokadem said he was disgusted and revolted by the injustice of this billing system. Mokadem's attorney attempted to have the bill written off, calling for administrative requirements to be balanced by decency, given the nature of the tragedy. In February 2010, Mokadem remarried Asme Beldi, a professor of Islamic law at the Faculty of Islamic Studies in Brussels. A daughter was born to the couple about a year later, and in 2013, it was reported that Mokadem had lost 30,000 euros in an investment scam and that he was being harassed by Genevieve's former attorney for further fees. Now, the conclusion on this story, I'm no longer speaking in script, I'm speaking off the cuff with my own thoughts. I want to give my opinion and angle on the motive. A lot of you who watch true crime don't like the opinion of the narrator. That's just who I am. I'm just like you. I read, I watch, I hear, and I formulate my thoughts. Now, in 1936, Dale Carnegie wrote the book How to Win Friends and Influence People. In this book, Dale argues as humans, there is a thirst and yearning for a need really spoken about, often ridiculed and at times stigmatized. This is the desire to be appreciated. You notice about children, for example, is if children don't get enough good attention, they'll certainly go after bad attention mm -hmm. because the fundamental human currency is attention. And it's, it's one thing to be hated, but it's another thing entirely to be ignored. And I would say, generally speaking, if you put people in a corner and you made them choose, you know, if they were, if they had knowledge that was transparent to themselves, you said, well, would you rather be ignored or hated? They'd take hated because at least then you exist because mm -hmm. you exist at least in some part in your relationship to other people. And so some of the bad behavior is 
is rewarded precisely for that reason is that it does draw attention and that does make you signify. I mean, yeah. you think about the people who do heinous crimes like the, the school shooters, people like that who do these things that are almost inconceivable. A huge part of the drive for that is fantasies about notoriety and, mm -hmm. and, 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 yep. and the emergence from obscurity and anonymity. Even though it's, it's notorious, it's hatred, the idea is, I'd rather be dead and infamous than alive and anonymous. Yeah. We all have our organic needs. Food, shelter, clothing, sleep, sex, wherever it may be. Five guys fries, in my case. But attention, feeling wanted, needed, important, feeling a part of something is as big a need as all needs that we have. When others pay attention to us, they connect us together, expanding our sense of identity. Their attention may also show esteem and give us some sense of status, as they recognize us as worthy of their attention. In the opposite sense, it is depressing and quite possibly insulting when others ignore us, particularly when we are in conversation with them. To deny attention is to deny the person's existence, effectively diminishing their sense of identity. And it's here where I feel Genevieve had her biggest gripe. Again, this isn't completely factual, it's just my own observation. But reading the story and the events leading up to the death of her children, my only conclusion is this is a story of neglect. She acted because she felt rejected. Her husband being away from home while she has five kids to take care of. She said she heard a voice as mentioned earlier. Maybe this was a psychotic break, but I'm not quite sure what she meant by that. Hearing voices is a common occurrence for those who suffer from mental illness. And she probably thought to herself, why is Dr. Shah here? I want to walk around my house in the privacy of my own existence with my children, with my husband. This in no way justifies her actions, but it does provide context into her own circumstances and what drove her and motivated her to commit this heinous crime. Finally, imagine that moment. She's there with any one of her kids, right? While the other kids are watching TV, she's there and she wants to strangle them. Now, I can't imagine what it's like trying to strangle someone, let alone trying to cut someone's throat. But with strangling, there's no output. For example, if you slit someone's throat, you see blood gushing out. They probably grab their neck and they start panting. Now just imagine that image. Not once, not twice, five times. I do believe most crimes are committed for simple motives. It could be financial, it could be jealousy, it could be heartbreak, it could in many ways be love. How a criminal goes about doing it may be complicated, but I do believe most reasons are simple human emotion. Again, I'm not diminishing the crime, I'm just giving you my observation on the psychological processes. But the link between neglect and slitting your children's throat, there's no excuse. And when I read about this, I felt disgusted. Either way, I do hope you enjoyed this story. Again, I go back to it. What drives a person to want to kill their own children? See, when you look at children, when you look at toddlers, right? One-year-old, two-year-old, when they start formulating their words, they can't even feed themselves. They can't even wipe themselves. Yet Genevieve had the courage. It's not courage, it is an act of weakness. But you understand what I mean by courage in this context, right? She overcame that mental, what's the word, disgust, disdain, like that. She overcame that mental block to stop you from doing something so heinous. And, and and moronic that she was able to do it as I mentioned earlier five times I am still flabbergasted maybe she did have a mental illness maybe the synapses in her brain the serotonin levels they obviously all must have gone haywire and yes it may be hard for me or you to conclude wait she did this over neglect but let's be real People have gotten killed for a lot less. I can't imagine what her, her ex-husband was feeling in his mind, probably acting normally. I'm sure he could run better as a husband. And I do find his Dr. Shah character kind of weird, but that doesn't result in this. So I do hope you enjoyed this story. I wanted to give light to the children who are unfortunately no longer with us. May they rest in peace. May Genevieve stay in prison for the rest of her life. And may their memory of the children never be forgotten.